Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about demonstration rocket for agile cislunar operation or Draco nuclear rocket. So let's dive right into it. So what happened is basically DARPA and NASA, they're getting married together and they're making a nuclear baby. Now this baby is supposed to demonstrate the nuclear thermal rocket engine in space. Now be mindful, this is an actual demonstration mission, not a final product. It's not like, oh, it's going to be used in Artemis 2 or Artemis 4. No, it's not like that. It's like, can we actually do it? That's the whole point. So these two are getting married for that. Now that marriage is called non-reimbursement inter interagency agreement or NIA. Basically, they are not transitioning in, in terms of money. They are not going to say, oh, for this expertise, I'm going to pay you this much for this job. I'm going to charge you this much. No, it's just like what you want. Of course, within limit, within reason, uh, they're going to have a collaboration, so to say. And government does that if they have to interact between two governments. There's no point like transferring money from point A to point B to point C. It's like it just goes round and round. So they have to have this sort of NIA in order to smooth things over. And the aim is that nowadays humanity is actually looking seriously for Mars and uh, chemical system while they are good while they can push us to Mars it's not wise because think of it this way with the moment human uh, chassis basically this puppy leaves earth atmosphere we start to go weak uh, radiation zero gravity so you want to reach Mars as quickly as possible so you do not have too much damage before you reach Mars you do not want to be like ah, I can barely do anything. You do not want to be like that. You want to be as healthy as possible. So how do you make sure of that? You reduce the time in dangerous environment, meaning zero G and uh, zero radiation shielding. So you make sure you reach Mars as quickly as possible. That's why for those sort of aim, they are developing this puppy. So it's supposed to turbocharge Mars exploration. So instead of just hoping and brute forcing our way to like, you know, Mars, we can be like, hmm. we can actually go to Mars while remaining in good health, good energy levels, less, uh, you know, uh, chances of failure so that's the aim of it final aim of it demonstrate the technology so we can develop a better mass project so there is a very amazing history of this puppy uh, this history was basically nasa was married to atomic energy commission back in the day and uh, they started this project known as nuclear engine for rocket vehicle application or nerva between 1960s and 1970s so this was their first marriage so to say in nuclear system and they actually built it like they built it they went from like making prototype reactor to a prototype test system to actual full fledged rocket system meaning there were only one generation uh, behind so to say from like actually putting it on a rocket that's how close they were and back in the day uh, people in nasa were, they were hyper optimistic about public support they thought like once they reach moon people will actually fund them to reach mars that did not happen they got bored of uh, basically moon itself and the moment soviet union poofed itself so people were like yeah what's the point so uh, that's why like this was developed in such a way that they knew saturn 5 is practically the biggest we can build like we cannot inherently build it 10 times bigger than that it's like that's uh, as big as we can fact practically go so there was like yeah, okay this rocket can barely do mars uh, basically barely do moon how the heck we're gonna do mars so they figured out they had to go nuclear for that that's why in 1960 and 70 they were developing this and there were some mock-ups that they developed for how the saturn 5 nuclear version will look like and the idea was uh, again do the same thing build an engine that is suitable for mars mission not suitable for like earth or basically launch pad to low earth orbit not like that is go from low earth orbit to mars that's the aim point of it and they built multiple iteration nrx models nrx one two three something like that. and the final iteration which they built before cancellation was xe prime now this puppy fired for 30 minutes now if you know anything about rocket engine that's a damn good uh, 30 minutes is awesome because we might put majority of rocket engines only work for eight minutes uh, unless you're talking about reusable one and not to mention even they come to earth then they get reused this puppy can literally do continuous or it can do multiple restarts in this scenario they had apparently 28 restart and I'm like why the heck they needed that much restarting simple fact was that if you are actually on low earth orbit you're going to boost yourself into higher orbit not in one continuous going maybe in multiple small burst or maybe in one continuous burst. you want your engine to be not like be like i'm limiting you you want your engine to be like i got you back you want to do smooth and gentle i got it you want brute force it i got it and again the moment they went to mars it again it had to do d cell burn and not to mention the idea was they're going to have small shuttles from uh, basically this craft to going to Mars, then hopping back on it. So it had to remain in orbit, of course, do course correction and things of that nature, start again. So they needed reliability of a restart as in like, restart, done, restart, done. Uh, 
So a lot of testing was there. And thermal power was around 1137 megawatts, serious power. And specific impulse they achieved was 841, almost double than the best we can do. So it was damn good, successful system. So you can see that, like it was a completely built system. Now the idea was this is the core, nuclear core. It's ready to fuse, uh, fuse I'm saying, fuse, uh, like again, nuclear splitting the atom. And they had controlled drums. Now drums had two sides of them. And these drums were supposed to rotate on their own axis. And the drums had like basically ab uh, absorber and reflector at the center. One time it's going to absorb it. So it's going to cool down the reactor. Basically neutron absorber is going to cool down. The other side is a reflector. It's going to bounce the neutron back in the core and core will become highly radioactive and start to fissioning process. So that's what's the throttle so to say. So everything else will remain fixed. Only these rods will rotate in their own drums. And that's how you want to control the throttle. So it was... Uh, Kind of like surprisingly how far they got uh, this puppy to work. And um, in 2020, they got 125 million, basically NASA got, uh, for uh, like basically restarting the research and development. This is what we are announcing and hearing now. It's basically a product of that 2020 R&D money that was around $125 million to restart that. And after that, I think NASA figured it out that they need a bit more oomph, a bit more nuclear expertise, which is DARPA's speciality. So DARPA and NASA is now making sure that they're going to do flight testing. That's why it's so ahead. It's like randomly, oh, we're going to develop something and randomly, oh, flight testing. How the heck they can go that fast? All the technology is all pre-built. Unless they have thrown the research data out of this, I'm pretty sure they can restart this puppy. And not to mention with modern material science, uh, they can even push performance beyond this, uh, what they have achieved in. XE. Be mindful, with XE engine they were uh, testing, they could have actually done mass mission. They're like, it, the engine was not a problem. Engine was like, bro, we're ready. We're good to go. Uh, uh, avionics and all that jazz, that had become so much efficient nowadays that we can do surprisingly lot more with lot less nuclear fuel. So what is the logic behind it? Logic is very simple. When you are building a rocket system, you have to figure out two things. It's like how fast you are throwing something and how much you are throwing something. Basically, do you have high exhaust velocity or do you have good mass flow or high mass flow? Ideally, you want both of them. You want like as fast as possible, like throw as close to light speed as possible and as much as you can throw, like multi-ton, gigaton, teraton, whatever have you. But here's the real world is like, bro, choose one. You can send tons of material down now, but it won't be very high velocity or you can send something very light, uh, but it's going to be super duper hyper fast. So that's the trade off. Like basically consider them as like voltage versus amps. Ideally, you want both of them as high as possible to transfer a lot of energy. But uh, realistically, you have like, bro, either you accept high voltage or you accept uh, high amps. You cannot ideally have both of them. So ion engines is a very good example. It has super high velocity. How high velocity? It can easily achieve 18 meters per uh, 18 kilometers per second kind of exhaust velocity. That's fast. Context, chemical engines can barely do like, you know, four, barely. So that's fast. But again, it has a mass flow that is in milligrams, not even milligrams, completely speaking. So it has like a lot of mileage. It, if you are going in low, deep space mission, if you have a nuclear reactor to provide energy for it, it can go very far, very fast, but it's very slow. The thrust, the oomph of this puppy is very weak. It's like if you fire it on Earth, it's not going to do anything. You have the biggest ion engine, put it in your hand, you can be like this. I'm not feeling anything. Like you, you will actually get tired and put it down and ion engines will not be able to move your hand itself. That's how weak it is because the mass flow is very low. So chemical engines gives you a lot of mass, like you are burning through tons of fuel, but it does not have velocity. Again, there is limited to four. Nuclear, on the other hand, it kind of uh, gets both of them to marry together and gives you high velocity around, instead of limited to four, you can touch eight kilometers per second. And uh, well, that will be the velocity and mass flow, go YOLO. You can go YOLO on mass flow. So that's how you can achieve very high space. That's the core logic of it. You are throwing something very fast and you're throwing a lot of it. That's the core principle of it. Now, where the heck you're gonna get the energy for it? That's the fusion part. Now, I'm reasonably sure most of you do understand that fusion is more than enough energy to do anything, especially in thermal domain. If you have to convert that thermal energy into something else, that's a different thing. But if you have to just thermal energy, just heat this puppy, you got this. Like nuclear fusion core is like, bro, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. So you use liquid hydrogen uh, to generate thrust. Now here's the deal. Why liquid hydrogen? Because you have to understand, if you have a reactor core and this core is heated to let's say 2000 degrees Celsius, you put anything to it, like anything, take whatever you want 
put into it like be it helium be it nitrogen be it water whatever have you if you put onto it and the temperature is fixed with let's say 2000 degrees celsius how much velocity you're going to get because of that temperature is limited by the mass basically if the lighter something is for example hydrogen it's going to travel fast if you put helium it's going to travel a bit slow if you put nitrogen even slower if you put water super slow and that's an, another aspect of it why the heck specific impulse of normal rocket engine is so limited exhaust from normal rocket engine even if it's a hydrogen system it's water vapor what's actually coming out of it is water vapor and that's why uh, when space shuttle was built the rocket engine while getting complete combustion it was over flooded with hydrogen because again you don't want hot exhaust you want fast exhaust so how do you convert whatever remaining temperature is there you over flooded with hydrogen or some other system basically if you have methane what is the exhaust exhaust is same hydrogen uh, basically water vapor and carbon dioxide at that point in time you may decide to overflow basically oxygen if it gives you a bit more oomph there and then you will have that extra basically co2 and h2o plus the extra that overflow component that's why every rocket has some overflow component you don't want hot exhaust you want fast exhaust here throw everything away just use hydrogen that gives you the most oomph for your system so for a uh, hundred tons of propellant you can get a lot of velocity from same reactor if you had hundred tons of anything else generally you have to find something that is lighter than hydrogen so look at periodical and good luck with that so that's why we have to use hydrogen it does come with its own consequences but hydrogen is the best system and that's why you can actually achieve 800 specific impulse Again, we do not have any rocket right now that has like hydrogen as its exhaust. We always have something that has CO2 as its exhaust or H2O as exhaust. Plus, most likely it will be CO2 plus H2O plus some extra. So that's the core logic behind it. So what about safety? Well, there comes the problem. The problem is this puppy is super hot. 2000 degrees Celsius may not sound that hot, but you have to understand things that can handle 2000 degrees Celsius on Earth reliably like metal furnaces and things of that nature, they're heavy. As in like, they are not measuring tons, they are measuring kilotons. That's how heavy those things can get. And again, they have ceramic and stuff and like a lot of stuff to make sure that they are that robust to handle it for long term. You're not going to put that on any rocket. Rockets are not going to fly. So you need something that can handle that sort of temperature for very long. And then you have naughty boy hydrogen. Then you have extra naughty boy known as radiation. All these three things combined, one of them is bad enough. If you have three of them combined, that's brutal. Because H2, without presence of oxygen, is still reactive. Hydrogen is not something that's like, oh, metal, I'm going to make love to metal. It's like, no, I'm going to destroy the metal. It's a very divorcee material. Like H2, if you have very high temperature of it, it can penetrate any metal shell. You have metal shell, hydrogen is like, nope. And it's going to cause what we call hydrogen metal embrittlement. Meaning, because hydrogen molecules are so small, it can actually penetrate deep into a metal lattice and then do things there. Basically, you can literally tear apart metal like on a crystal level. So very reactive. And then you add heat to it. That turbocharges that process. So that is very brutal. High heat H2 reactivity is a destroyer class temperature. Basically, it's like good luck building anything that can handle it for long term. You can build it that can handle it for a few minutes, but good luck making sure. Yeah, this is a thing that can work for like two, three years. Nah, that's the problem. And then we come to reactor. Because you want velocity, exhaust velocity, the only vector you have control over is reactor. And you want reactor to be as hot as possible. So you can get the most of velocity. If you do not do that, you might as well not build a nuclear reactor because your specific impulse will go down. So you have to do it. That's why you cannot replace hydrogen with helium that is far more stable. You have to use hydrogen, otherwise your specific impulse goes down. Reactor also has to be almost at red limit. Now there's a problem with that. If you push it to that kind of melting level, it needs active cooling 24 into 7. Because even if you shut down the reactor basically, even if you have that, it still needs some flow around it, otherwise it will melt or damage something guaranteed. So it needs hydrogen as cooling. Basically it's the same thing what SR-71 did when it was traveling at Mach 3. It's like everything is hot. How the heck you make sure the person inside does not get cooked? You are talking about 200 degrees Celsius coolest temperature outside. So how the heck uh, you're gonna make sure that somebody inside can survive at like 24 degrees Celsius? You run your AC. Now here's the AC is like, bro, I'm only a heat pump. I can pump heat from A to B. Where is the, my cold reservoir? So they dumped that heat into JP8, Jet Propellant 8. And then they jump, uh, once the fuel started to boil, they dumped that fuel into engine and like, bye. Same thing you are doing here. You are basically taking hydrogen, liquid hydrogen. It's going to cool down the reactor, take the heat and just eat into the space. So be mindful. If the reactor is running full power and you have any fault in uh, basically hydrogen flow, you have to figure out a reactor that can shut down almost instantaneously. Because if you fail to do so, yeah, things are going to melt. Because again, you are almost at red line. So it is inherently a very dangerous balancing act can it be done yes 
but it is one of those things that like do you really want to do it and core is a radioactive hazard like there is no two ways around it we had put a lot of nuclear reactors back in the days in spying satellites yes lot of them both sides basically russia and usa both of them had lot of nuclear power plants going in satellites and yes some of them did crash and yes they did cause a radioactive incident so it is one thing that you're like yeah it's not just like oh put a reactor and don't think about it no it's something that you have to think about it it's a hazard and rockets sometimes do go this is my personal favorite rocket goes up and it's like boop so and this is like on nasa's pad things happen you have to understand this like this will happen and this has enough energy that uh, it can damage majority of containments and people are, some people are talking about like what if we make the containment super awesome yes deal you can make it super awesome you can make it that this happens or the containment is like bro that's too stiff for me like i don't even care here's a problem with that it's not going to go anywhere the moment you put it in an orbit and you start the, its engine is like <sighs> Why? It will be too heavy. It's like, you know, uh, you, you have a truck. Truck is not going to accelerate as fast as a motorbike. The same thing. You want motorbike kind of system. So casing, can it be made as a very hard as possible? Yeah, but there is a limit. And again, if specific impulse goes down to chemical level, might as well use chemical level. So safety is very critical, like knife's edge. So what we can expect in the future? Well, reality is uh, NASA is hyper optimistic with it. I have linked their uh, full video down below and they're planning for 2027, which I was like, I'm pretty sure I heard it wrong and I hope I heard it wrong because that's too damn close. Did they like NERVA project have like every test article fully intact? Because again, that was in 1975. So it's quite a long time have passed. So I'm not sure how the heck they can be that confident or did DARPA worked in the background because be mindful there were a lot of nuclear satellites. So there is a very good chance that uh, DARPA never shut down that research. They had like, you know, low intensity research on that. It's a very good tool for deep space. Is it important for moon? No. Is it important for Mars? Yes. If it can cut down travel time from months to 100 days, that's awesome because be mindful our body is like has a clock. The moment you leave Earth's shielding, the moment you leave Earth's uh, gravity, the clock starts. You want to be on Mars as quickly as possible because Mars will have 50% less radiation. Why? There's a planet below your feet. So you are not getting cooked from all 360 degree sides. You're only getting cooked from 180 degree sides. So that's why radiation goes half if you're on Mars. So radiation, but and again, because there is some gravity there, again, not as amazing as Earth's gravity, but there is something there. It should help human bodies uh, to adjust and deal with it. So it's a very good tool for deep space mission. Now, human rating a nuclear reactor in space it's going to be tough, not impossible, but tough. And uh, there is only one way I can figure out like how to make this sort of puppy safe. It's basically you have to do what we call in space refueling, so to say. Basically, you build a rocket, complete rocket as light as possible, as final, like barely have enough shielding, basically what we call shadow shielding. You have a reactor which is fully exposed and you have a shield only at the back of it. And then the rocket is here. So you're creating a shield shadow. It was done in uh, basically old days of nuclear aircraft. Yes, they actually did that. And again, they tried a shadow system of uh, basically protecting only the important part. It was not enough. But again, uh, for space, you can do it. It's just that if you have that sort of shadow shielding, you uh, react core has to be very uh, carefully, quote unquote, put there. So you can send it completely different. Like you have a whole rocket, then you have this core that has protecting like 10,000 tons of armor. Again, 10,000 is too high. But you get that point. Like it has like 100 tons of armament. And just to make sure that nothing bad happens to it. Then you go to space and then you remove the casing, put the fuel inside and then bye bye. That could be one way of making sure it's safe enough that even if something bad happens when the core, the highly enriched part is there, nothing bad could actually happen, practically speaking. That could allow to reduce the what we call launch risk. It will not make it zero, but it can make it low enough where it's like it's manageable. So that's the future aspect of it. Oh, again, uh, Nerva Project also had an amazing video from Department of Defense. I have linked that video down below also. Please check them out. So this was my presentation on basically the nuclear Draco. Uh, hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please leave the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.